think about being faithful to the Lord. I think this is an important question. And uh, uh, we need to get closer to God and feel confident that we are in His fellowship, in His presence. And uh, yet, how we measure our closeness to God is tricky. It's uh, a little difficult to put uh, a measure on that. The reason, in particular, that this lesson is a part of this series is, remember, I was looking for uh, lessons that I thought might offset and help people in view of those that uh, I was working closely with that fell away. And uh, I've mentioned this, but there were three young people in, the, in particular that were very faithful, dedicated, hard workers in the kingdom. Um, two of them newly converted, and uh, they were even extra studies and uh, seeking others and yet then lost their way along the way a few years into and after their conversion. And, uh, and the question that we're looking at in this lesson, I have seen in a couple of other places where, where people begin to feel like, I just don't feel close to God anymore. I, I can't figure out, I, I go to worship, I sit in worship, I don't feel God's presence, I don't feel close to God, I don't feel what I used to feel, or... And, and really the, an emptiness that somehow was present for them as they thought about their spiritual relationship with God. Uh, sometimes we get discouraged and sometimes we do feel like we're a long way from the Lord. We feel like maybe He's not very near us. And I think it's, it's a serious enough question and idea that it deserves consideration, not just to brush up, oh, you just need to toughen up and do what the Lord tells you to do. Oh, I think that's true. But I don't think that helps the individual at the point. Um, we do need to, to deal with our emotions because we have to figure out what they're for and, and what place they have in our lives and, and how we're going to react to them because they are a reality that are a part of our being as much as a lot of other things that are important to us. So I do want to consider this question. But so how do I get close to God? Well, um, in the question... I started the lesson. So, okay, where do I begin? I didn't know where to begin. So, if you don't know where to begin, you start with the concordance. So, I start with the concordance, and I said, okay, I'm going to look up all of the verses in the Bible that I can find that talk about getting close to God. Um, I can't remember, this a few years ago when I did these lessons, I can't remember if I included the Old Testament or not at this point. Probably just started with the New. And uh, I used the concordance and tried to figure out any combination of words that would lead me to passages that talk about getting close to God. So close to God, near God, nigh God. And so I just started working on those and looked them up and ran down every reference and marked them down. If I could put them in categories, I would do that. And so man, I got this, this material. Well, I've misled you a little bit. I looked for those words and looked and looked and looked, and I could find very very few. There just weren't passages in the Bible that talk that much about being close to God. And we sang a good song about it, Near My God to Thee, a beautiful song, a good song. And we are going to look at a couple passages that do talk about nigh to God and near God. Uh, there's a couple. There's a few. But I, we learn by what we see in the Bible. And I want to suggest sometimes we start looking, we're going to learn from what we don't see in the Bible. We have some presuppositions and things that we anticipate and are pretty confident that God has in there somewhere and we go looking for them. If we don't find them, we need to take that as a part of the revelation. I'm not concerned about that. I'm not talking about that. And we need to recognize the power that that part of God's leaving something alone has. If God leaves it alone, then I need to leave it alone. And so that, the first thing I had was, well, that's just something that God does not talk about very much. And we'll look at the few passages that I found, but for now, let's just consider this idea that the Bible just doesn't say that much about being close to God. However, I did, in my determination to find something, narrow it down, well, what about to God? <laughs> we'll find verses that say something about to God. You can put whatever you want in front of that. And here's what I found. I found a lot more verses. There were verses that talked about being or becoming acceptable to God. Pray to God or giving thanks to God. 
Now, you're hearing these. Yeah, yeah, okay, now I see that. Being reconciled to God, giving glory to God, or all glory to God, well-pleasing to God, and people who turn to God. Now, we see that, okay. And, and your mind, as a Bible student, you, you say, okay, I can't remember all of those, but a few, maybe you re remember a reference here, a reference there, but you know, you read those ideas all of the time. And what I want to suggest here, it's really going to lead you to the next chart, and that is, when you look at the first side with our introduction about this idea of being close to God and near God, we're thinking about this personal relationship with God, and I don't mean to demean it or, or look down on it in any way, but we're thinking about something more like an emotional connection and touching God and holding God, feeling the warmth of God. It's about that feeling thing. And here, what we see, well, this is more about God's God, and I'm here. And so there's this rever reverential distance between me and God. This is talking about getting real close and near and cuddly with God. This is talking about to God be all the glory and to God may I humbly be reconciled to God. We see the difference in those two lists. And so I'm really giving you the process that I was going through as I thought about this lesson and what we need to learn. And this is exactly the steps that were a part of the study in the beginning. Of course I needed to look at these passages and think further. But I think that was, that's an important part of our understanding here. It's already set a tone that I think we need to recognize is useful and important. And that is that there must always be a reverential distance from God. And by distance from God, I mean to realize that He is God. And we are not only human beings and His creation, and in that sense, far below Him, but we are unworthy in the sense of our, our sin and our guilt and our offenses against Him, the things we've done. We deserve nothing from Him. Um, we do not deserve grace and we do not deserve His love, but yet He extends those to us and that starts pulling us toward Him, of course. But even as we embrace forgiveness, aren't we a little embarrassed before Him? Don't we still feel we should be better? I should be better. And uh, yes, there is a passage that talks about appearing boldly before the throne. We'll get there. But let's consider this part at least first. And the reality is we start to read these passages, passages is that really my uh, approach to God is only on the basis of, first of all, reconciliation and forgiveness... And secondly, by faith. You know, getting close to God. You want to get close to God? Well, the first thing you need to think about is how to get forgiveness. Because you're a sinner. You're not worthy. You don't belong in His presence. And I'm not just talking about you. I'm talking about all of us. That's, that's where we are. And getting close to God needs to start with the humility that comes with the guilt that we feel before God. In 1 Peter 3.18... For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but may, being made alive in the Spirit. Now there's a basis on which we can get close to God or come to God. Jesus died. In the flesh, he was put to death. And he suffered for our sins so we could come to God reverence and this distance that we feel distance by view of his justice and love and mercy and my unworthiness I think if we want a right and a good and a strong relationship with God we will never forget that that that's the basis for our relationship with God Ephesians 2 verse 13 but now in Christ you who were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And we should never forget that. That is a verse that's talking of com contrasting the Jews who were closer to God by virtue of the law and the temple and the tabernacle. And yet you Gentiles, you are way out there. You are so far separated from God. But now even you who were so far away from God, you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. But in reality, all Jews and Gentiles, we're all brought near only by the blood of Christ. 
And so that begins to set the tone for this idea of being close to God. So how do I feel about that? I come into God's presence on the first day of the week, on the last day of the week, on the middle of the week, and I'm going to come before God. I need to remember that I have right to speak to God only through Jesus Christ who died so that God could forgive and come put away my sin and my guilt. Shame on me. And we need to come in humility. This reverence is what we need to feel. But secondly, we've already looked at Hebrews 11 and uh, verse 6. We come to God by faith. We want to come into the presence of God. Well, we're not coming into the presence, presence of God. We come into the presence of God by faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please Him. We've got to believe that He is, that He's the rewarder. And remember our discussion about that faith is really the basis of our relationship. Without faith, there is no relationship. Because we do not see Him. We do not feel Him or hear Him or touch Him. We believe in Him and we believe Him. Two different things. Believing in Him means that we know He exists. In faith, we know He exists. But believing Him means that we trust Him, that we do what He says, uh, and we hear His words, and, and those words govern us. And the basis of our relationship is how close am I going to get to God when it's by faith? If there's a problem with the, the nearness that I'm measuring here, it's my problem. It's not God's problem. Because our relationship is based on faith, and so let's, let's work on our faith. Last lesson. So those are some ideas that help us see that there will always be a reverential distance. I made that word up. I don't know if it's really in the dictionary or not. But I hope you understand what I mean, that, it, that, that there's this fear and this respect and reverence and honor to God, our Creator and our Savior, uh, of whom we are unworthy. And so, where I want to go to this go with this on a practical level is I, I need to be careful about my attitudes that talk about my personal relationship with God and getting close to God. I need to beware of a casual, familiar attitude that diminishes the significance of the separation between me and God by virtue of who He is and who I am and what He has done and what I have done. There's the reconciliation of forgiveness. That's the only basis that I, I can speak to Him. And so when I talk about my personal relationship with God, I, I don't believe I can say that, well, I, you know, I know God, He's going to come down on my level. Or I know God, He loves me so much, it's just like He's got me, I'm sitting on His lap. It, it made me uncomfortable just to say that right now. I just don't believe that's the nature of our relationship when we talk about a, a close and a personal relationship with God. A close and a personal relationship with God, I mean, on His side of it, I'm not sure I can fully understand and comprehend what He is doing. and I can understand what He's told me. His love and His care, seen in His forgiveness and the giving of His Son. And that He does not even resent me in the forgiving of His Son. I can't comprehend that. But I'm not ready to assume that I'm sitting in His lap. My close and personal relationship with God, that has to do with my personal responsibility to Him. My personal appreciation and gratitude to Him. My personal honor and humility that I feel before Him. That's all very personal. And that if I'm going to go to heaven, if God is going to save me by His grace, it's going to be because the choices that I have made, the commitment that I've made, the service that I've offered is arising out of a personal commitment to Him. And again, we're still not talking about something warm and fuzzy and, and cuddly, but we're talking about inner and deeper and uh, uh, personal feelings and decisions. And so, so what's that got to do with my feelings? So, well, we're, we're trying to find our way here. So what do we do about our emotions with regard to our personal relationship with God? I've sufficiently, I think anyway, sufficiently emphasized this matter of reverence and honor and, and the, the, the distinction. We're creatures, and we are sinful creatures, and He is the Creator and a, a loving, forgiving uh, Savior. So let's talk about how we feel about stuff and how we feel about our relationship with God in particular. 
I'm asserting something here. We'll see if we'll see if you believe that uh, I'm speaking properly here. But I believe that spiritual strength is not measured, not properly measured, by our feelings and our emotions. I think it's dangerous to judge our spiritual strength on the basis of how we feel. And I certainly believe in in emotions. I mean, I'm not stupid. I've got emotions, right? I'm scared. I'm happy. I'm sad. Uh, sadness to depression sometimes. I feel love and affection. Uh, I get angry. I, I you know. Uh, but when we think about our relationship with God, sometimes we're disappointed when there is a lack of some things. And I want you to know that I am not in any sense insulting or diminishing anyone because I know this is a struggle and a spiritual battle for people as they try to figure out what to feel and how to react emotionally to the Lord. And some feel these things more, uh, more, uh, more certainly and definitely and others do not express. But the idea of tears... Have you ever shed tears in worship? And, and some of you can say yes, and some of you can say, I'm not sure. I don't remember for sure. And so who's weak and who's strong? Is that the measure? Or, you know, chills when you get the, the goosebumps or your hair kind of stands up on your arm. You feel a warm glow. Your heart ever kind of flutter, literally or metaphorically, either one. And do you ever get excited about God and His Word? And do we get those goosebumps? And uh, the word emotionalism is dangerous because when you put the ism on there, then that becomes an idea of itself rather than just emotions. Um, so there's a difference between feeling and emotions and then turning over to emotionalism as a governing factor, uh, a basis on which we make decisions and choices. In Acts chapter 4... Well, I forgot to ask that question. Uh, let's list passages to describe the spiritual feelings of true disciples of Christ. Where are they? I'm not asking anybody to speak up because some of you have thought of one or two already. And some of you can't think of any. And I don't want any of you to be embarrassed. Uh, if, if I were sitting out there, I'd say, I hope you didn't call on me. <laughs> but can you, think of, can you think of any place in the Scriptures where faithful disciples of Christ are identified and telling about a situation and then how they feel? Is described. It's a little tricky, right? I don't, it's not totally gone. There's the Ethiopian who was converted on the road to uh, 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 toward Gaza, down, the, and after his baptism, he went on his way, rejoicing. Well, we know something about his emotions there. His heart was full of joy, and he was open with it. Rejo he was rejoicing. That's doing something. I don't know if he was singing or laughing or smiling or what, but he had emotions, and, and they were generated by his by a spiritual uh, relationship and, and, and action. So let's let's find another one in worship, uh, particularly in worship. Well, we're supposed to sing and make melody in our hearts, and in their joy and rejoicing in there somewhere. It seems like yeah, it seems like it with grace in our hearts. I, that sounds like. Emotion, hard to nail that one down, but grace is favor or goodwill. Okay, yeah, we've got goodwill and favor in our hearts toward God. Do we feel that? There's an emotion. But you get my point. It's a little hard to find much about the emotions, and all I want to suggest is we need to put this in its place. Emotions do not seem to be, all right, let's get spiritual, emotions, and let's talk all about that. The Bible doesn't do it that way. And so, are emotions in there somewhere? Absolutely they are. But let's not make them a priority, as I started by saying, are they a true sense or judge or measure of spirituality? They don't, they don't have that place in Scripture. But in Acts chapter 4, we've got such a great story about the disciples who are fervent, who are strong, and... Uh, find themselves in situations where emotions do bubble to the surface, I believe. In Acts chapter 4, the, uh, uh, Peter and John had been released from prison. They were arrested after they healed the lame man in the temple, 
and preached to a bunch of people, and a lot of people were baptized, and the authorities come and put them in prison until the next day, and say, what do you think you're doing? And go after them. At this point, they, they threatened them. I can't remember. They may have beaten them too, but they at least threatened them and challenged them. You do not preach anymore in his name. Just really let them have it there. And chapter 5, they're going to arrest them again, and uh, I think that is when they beat them. Well, when, uh, when Peter and John get out of prison, in verse 23, 423, being let go, they went to their own companions and reported that the chief priests, all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And so they, they report to the church. What happened? What happened? Well, and they, and they tell the congregation. 24 says, so when they heard this, the congregation, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and sea and all that's in them, who by the mouth of your servant David had said, why do the nations rage and why do the people plot vain things? The kings of earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his holy Christ. People have been doing that for centuries. Where did that get them? Verse 27. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the Word of God with boldness. It touches on the edge of emotion there. We just know that there was emotion there. It doesn't really describe it. But we can feel the emotion ourselves when we read that. And part of it comes from a relief that the apostles are okay, I think. You know, when you... You know, you have that letdown of, of you got the fear of what might happen, and then we come out of it, and we're emotional. We, we cry after it's over with. Why? Well, it's okay. Why are you crying now? Well, it's just the emotion is bubbling up. And, uh, and we can't stop talking. Uh, we're so relieved. And we know the emotion that comes in those situations after a crisis. But as they come together and say, God, here we go again. Through the centuries, the greatest of the great of all humanity have, have made themselves your enemy and they align their armies and they do their deeds and it all amounts to nothing. Just about like Pontius Pilate and Herod and Jesus' death. Ha! They thought they were so clever and they just did what you wanted them to do anyway. And so then this confidence that they have, we know that it's all going to work out all right. That feeling is a part of this assembly. And so then they pray for the boldness to speak the word. And that miracles will continue so that they can teach others. And they're praying in verse 31. And when they finish, the place was shaken. I don't think that's metaphoric. I think that's the way that's written sounds like that God really shook the building. The Holy Spirit came upon them and the place was shaken. Um... I tell you, there, there's some assemblies of God's people where nothing shakes physically, but things are shaking metaphorically. The brethren are stirred, and they feel the power of God. What do they, what do they really feel? They feel their own faith, their commitment, their determination. They feel the relief, and what that has done for their confidence moving forward. And they feel powerful and invincible in God, knowing that they might go to prison too. But they're ready, to, they're ready to go into battle here. Spiritually speaking, they're ready to go to battle. Uh, there's no indication. In fact, it would be hard. You'd be hard-pressed to, to even conclude that this is possibly the first day of the week. So what, what evening, we assume, what evening was this or what day was this? Well, it was a midweek study. I throw a little thing in here about midweek study for people who want to be close to God. If you missed this assembly, let's not even raise the question of whether or not it's a required assembly. But if you missed this gathering, 
you would have regretted it. Man, I wish I had been there for that. You know, we need to be with God's people because that's where the stuff happens. That's where our growth and that's where our strength and that's where our emotions are stirred for God. And not every assembly turns out to shake the building. Not every assembly will stir us like other assemblies. Do we know that? Well, that one we know by experience. Some assemblies, may I say this, that some assemblies, it's almost as like it's hard to breathe. Like, and we just kind of get through. It just too many people are absent. They're all sick or on a trip somewhere, and there's just four of us. And, and, and the preacher hadn't gone anywhere. He's here, and he's doing the best he can, but he just doesn't have a whole lot of oomph today either. And the singing up. You know, we've got those assemblies, but I'll tell you what, enduring those assemblies will make you better. <laughs> but they don't feel that good. I'll be glad when everybody gets back and we're all in a good mood again. And, and then we have those assemblies. And then we have the assemblies where we learn something uh, about our membership or about an, a, a, a saint or a circumstance or a progress that's made or even a threat that's come our way. And we, we're talking about what we're going to do about that. And we gather and we pull together and we depend on each other in a way that we don't do every single assembly. And so assemblies are going to vary in their intensity and in their emotion and in the kind of emotion, not just in the amount of emotion. But we see in this text that there is a lot of emotion. And when you, when you read the scriptures, you can read a lot about love and joy and peace. Are those emotions? I, I think they are. Those, those are descriptions of how we feel. I feel love or loved. I feel joy or I feel peace. Those are emotions. They're in, uh, part of our emotional makeup. But now the tricky question is, are these words where they're used in scripture, are they conditions Thing, descriptions of how I feel or are they commandments? They're commandments, aren't they? We are supposed to love. We don't wait for love to, to just kind of wait for it, Lord. We're, you know, when's the love going to show up here? I, you know, I'm not feeling it. No, no, no. You're supposed to do that one. Do love and joy. Rejoice in the Lord always is a commandment, right? We know that. And peace. Let the peace of God. Well, that, one's, that sounds a little more passive. But I think even there, if we look at those texts, we see that that's something that we're pursuing and we're bringing into ourselves. And contentment. Be content. Be content. And they are more commands than they are conditions. And so, spiritual strength, then, is this, this vague thing that is absolutely a part of what we are in Christ and in God. And we need to be concerned about the way we feel when we worship and when we are thinking about the Lord and thinking about our responsibilities, and thinking about our brothers and sisters of Christ. But they're not accurate measures of our spirituality because they are constantly fluctuating based on our circumstances and based on how I'm reacting to the circumstance. How do I get close to somebody anyway? Just anybody, God or anybody else. Well, you got to get to know them. You got to trust them. You don't get close to somebody that you don't trust. So this trust is in here. And, and then affection comes, in typically in that order, right? And those aren't magic. I think you probably would figure that out. That's how you get close to people. That's how you get close to God as well. You get close to God when you know them. And what then comes out of that is this communion and that communion or that association with this person, we're talking about friends on the earth or we're talking about a relationship with God, you're not going to get to know, you're not going to get close to somebody if you don't know them, if you don't trust them, if you don't have an affection. But as those things grow, they grow because we have shared time together and we have shared experiences together. And usually that sharing, it needs to be frequent. And it, if you really want to get close to somebody, you go through struggles together. I mean, that's when, that's when it really blossoms, doesn't it? You suffer together. Or one of you is suffering, and the other one just jumps in there and suffers with and helps and sacrifices in that suffering with and helping. And then you come out of that, 
And now you look each other in the eye, and you've got this memory of pain, and you grin because you both made it. Right? That's the way that works. You think we're going to get close to God with anything less? We've got to do that with the Lord. So how do we do that? How do we get to know and trust and have an affection for God? Well, there's lots of passages. and We're not going to read all of those. I want to read the, the one that's underlined, or at least read a part of that. In 1 John, on knowing God, 1 John 2, 3, and 4, Hereby we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. Don, you just keep coming back to that, you know, that stuff. I want to feel something. Well, I'm looking for verses here. You know God by listening to what He has to say and then doing what He has to say. Your friend says, you know, I'm, not, I'm really not feeling well today. Do you think you could do something for me? I'm, I'm not even listening. Oh, what? What? I said, I'm not feeling so good today. Could you help me out here? Could you do something for me? No, nah, no, nah, I ain't got time today. Okay, well, well that, okay, that happened. But how many times can I do that? And that friendship is just, it's just kind of dead in, the, dead in the water there. It's just sitting. And so if, if we're going to be close to God, we're going to listen to Him. We're going to do what He wants us to do. And that's how we get to know God, by keeping His commandments. Uh, excuse me. In, uh, in James chapter 2, on the trusting God, uh, faith is shown and made perfect but when it works through love when it works and Abraham was justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar and it says in that same text right there that he was called the friend of God we want to be the friend of God not many times in scripture that those more casual words are used for a relationship with God Enoch walked with God Noah was the friend of God and uh, and and uh, Noah trusted God, believed God, and he did whatever God wanted him to do. So again, that is the key element in our closeness to God. The third one, we need to love God, John 14, 15 through 23. Uh, I do want to turn there and read more of that. This, this text will help us, I think. John 14, I'm beginning in verse 15, and this is a longer reading, but I want you to listen. If you don't even turn there, at least listen well. And think about the idea of loving God, which is in here, abiding with or being with any concept that suggests a nearness to God. And let's look for things that, that Jesus says here. 15, chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you, Jesus says. Okay, this is that passage talking to the apostles where Jesus is promising them the working of the Holy Spirit in a miraculous and a powerful way that they can be apostles. That's right. But this is how the apostle, we're going to feel close to God. So let's just take those concepts from this passage. Verse 19. A little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. What do you mean by that? Well, I'm not going to be here and the world won't see me. But you'll see me. By faith. And in the things that I will do in you. But you will see me. And that day you will know that I am in my Father and you and me, and I and you. This is talking about being close to God, isn't it? He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. That's about as intimate a passage as you can find in the New Testament. There's some psalms that, that speak in this kind of terms, of this closeness, and very emotional. They're psalms. 
But in the New Testament, this paragraph is about as intimate a description of a, of a relationship with God as, as you can find. And it comes back to love and abiding in and abiding with and being close to. And on our side of the bargain, it always involves our obedience and His Word and obeying His commandments. That's what the Bible talks about when it talks about being close to God. And so we will feel close to God when we understand the significance of that relationship and we see ourselves walking with God by keeping His commandments. That's how we get close to God. I'm going to finish by looking at two passages that do talk about being near God. In uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We've come to the, in Hebrews, you've come to the end of the doctrinal explanation of the relationship of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And the Old Covenant has served its purpose, and it's been a type and a figure, and brought us to Christ. And really in chapter 10, uh, he's kind of nailed that down, that that covenant has been satisfied and fulfilled, and there's a new covenant. And it has been inaugurated with the blood of Christ. And so in chapter 10, verse 19, Therefore, brethren, let's make some practical application here. You're in Christ with a new covenant and a new opportunity for a relationship with God. And he says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by the new and the living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more, as you see the day approaching. This is one of the few passages that really talks about coming close to God, drawing near, nigh to God. And so we've got this boldness to go into the most holy place. The metaphor is the tabernacle and later the temple. That we know only the high priest went in there only once a year. We say that all the time. And because even that is suggesting the separation from God. And yet through Christ... We have become priests, and we don't just go into the front room, we go into the back room, into the most holy place. And we've got that boldness, not because we are something, but because we've been washed by the blood. There's still that reconciliation that had to happen, that repentance. And so in all humility, we confidently take that step. If we were going to do it literally instead of metaphorically, I'm not so sure we'd be all that confident. I think we'd stick the toe in there and kind of wait and see what happened. Because coming into the presence of God would be awesome. But here we come in. We come in by the new and living way. And this is by His sacrifice and His flesh. Again, the, the, the forgiveness is, 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 what, is what has to happen. So even, verse 22, as we draw near, we've got to... Remember that. But we draw near, verse 22, we draw near with a true heart. So there's the sincerity. Am I sincere? If I don't have a sincerity in all of my faith, in my reverence, in my honor, my thanksgiving, if that's not genuine, it's going to feel empty. But we come with a sincerity in verse 22. And we come with a true heart in the full assurance of faith. Do you really believe that as we gather together as God's people in this pathetic, I'm sorry, pathetic little place, that this is something wonderful and magnificent and awesome, that we are in the presence of God? And then we eat the bread that you can buy anywhere and the grape juice that's plentiful and it's just grape juice. And we sit together and we pray in the full assurance of faith, we know that, that that moment was wonderful. That we had the opportunity and that what it means. 
And so, in the full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, that we are what we are because we've been forgiven by the love of God. Now, if you're ever going to feel warm, it's in the remembrance of forgiveness. And I'm not going to get any of those feelings from you guys. I'm going to get those feelings from within by my faith and understanding and sincere recognition of the truth. Whatever is created in a cathedral, whatever is created by powerful music, and I mean powerful music, whatever is created by holding hands, whatever, is, whatever emotions are created by all of the substitutes that are used in religion to generate the feelings that people want are artificial and material. Because when we don't hold hands, then we've lost whatever spirituality we had. And if the, if the organ isn't powerful and the chorus isn't truly harmonious, it just doesn't get it for us. And really, is spirituality dependent on these external circumstances? You might as well go to a pep rally at a high school football game. I mean, you can get stirred. I remember those days. And what was that? Well, these people aren't even going to come to the game. <laughs> Man, we get together and holler, it feels good. It's, it's not the real thing. And so we, we need to see that in true spirituality, the emotions will come from the faith and the submission and that assurance that we feel in God because we know His Word and we trust His promises. And we know that we've committed ourselves fully and completely to Him. And that this moment and this place and these people are more important than anything else in my life. And, and you're not every day, but some days you're going to feel that very strongly and, and emotionally. And other days, you'll just know that it's there. And your spirituality is not diminished on the days that, that the tears don't crop up. It's, it's not. Because you know those things just as strongly as the next week when you just kind of smile. This is a good thing. And, and you don't cry. Don't cry today. Today I'm feeling the happiness of it. And so, nearer my God to thee. Nicely done the song. Uh, the other passage in James is James 4. Let me read this one a little bit more quickly. In James chapter 4, another passage that very specifically addresses being close to God. See, there's not very many, but here's another. In chapter 4, <coughs> verses 1 through 6, he's going to talk about people who are not close to God. And he's warning saints about this. You know, where does wars and fights and strife, where does it come from? It comes from your own desires and the pleasure that war in your members. And that pleasure is pretty strong emotion too, you know. So emotions are, don't mean a lot for good or for bad. You lust in two, you do not have. Uh, you ask and you do not receive in verse 3. Adulterers and adulteresses, you're not faithful to the Lord. Don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? The quickest way to be separated from God is to become the world's friend and make worldly people your better friends. Don't do that. Whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself the enemy of God. And verse 5 is just a question that's raised. Don't you know that the Spirit knows that about you? You can't pull one over on him. He knows that. So realize that. He gives grace to the humble. To the humble. How good does humility feel? Humility is a little bit like guilt. It doesn't feel good. But when we feel guilt, that's a good thing. It helps us get out of it. And when we feel humility, it's not pleasant. But it's a good thing. It puts us where we need to be. So God gives grace. That's who he favors. You're closer to God in your humility than you are in your strength. And we know passages that talk about that. So, verse 7, here's what you need to do. You want to get close to God? 7. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Yeah, but how? Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded the Lord knows he's got a little bit tugging here towards the Lord, but i got a little bit pulling this way. There's some other things that are pretty important to me too. Come on. You've got a single purpose. You've got a single master. 
cleanse your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep, and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. I'm almost convinced at this point that I'm closer to God when I assemble for worship and I just cry through the whole thing. Out of guilt and remorse and humility and worthlessness. I don't really mean that, but there's a lot in here that's pulling us down. And when we are pulled down before God, He'll lift us up. That's when we're close to God. Thank God that we can then lift our eyes and wipe them off and look up and see Jesus raising, being raised from the dead after the sacrifice that I caused and start to feel some joy. God loves me. What else matters? And we will feel close to God. I hope the lesson has helped us. We need sincerity and we need purity as we come close to God. And there is no magic formula and certainly the gimmicks that are used to stir emotions in religious service will not bring us to God. We need to keep His Word and uh, obey Him. There may be some this morning subject to the call of Jesus. He wants you to come closer. You come by faith. You come in humility as you repent of your sins and obey Him. First and foremost, by being baptized for the remission of sins. And then follow His Word after that. Follow His Word. If we can help you, come to the front as we stand this way. Show us this is number 72, Healing in His Wings. It's not a conventional invitation song, but it works. <laughs>